All right, so today we're going to be talking about Pierre Boulez's second piano sonata. This is one of his most famous works, and Pierre Boulez actually didn't write that many works in his time. Contrary to popular belief, he was very specific about what he was going to write, so he often just completely destroyed things that he didn't like. His piano sonatas have been very influential, especially his third piano sonata, which implements a form where the performer gets to choose the path they want to take along the piece, kind of allowing for a more free-flowing form compared to uh, earlier pieces, which form was a big uh, changing factor in music at the time. Okay, so we're going to listen to the first 15 measures of the piece. Uh, we get some clearly identified themes that are repeated, even though the writing seems quite random. Now, one of the most striking instances of the piece is that first off, we have no time signature. This is because, uh, actually, if we go to the notes at the beginning, uh, it says to pay extreme respect to rhythms and silences and that bar lines are only for visual reference. So, and this way, the meter is not very relevant and the beats in the measure can often change. This is almost a rough estimation of what he wants to be played. And the performer, he says this in his notes as well, that it's up to the performer to create some of the nuances that have been written down in the piece. And our first kind of theme we have is this uh, four eighth note statement right here. It sounds like this right at the beginning. And it's quite easy to pick out if you've listened to the piece enough of times, but you'll find that even though this is repeated a lot of times, for example, on page two, we receive it four times, uh, three of which it's in this downward motion, which is two repeated notes and then a downward motion, but this time it's inverted so that it has two notes and then it goes up. Now, basically what this is, is it's him recycling a theme and using it as a new, uh, a kind of a new way rather than just repeating it and transposing it. Now, if we were to analyze this with either a set theory or even just with the intervals, I have a lot of it written down. Uh, the first example that we have, uh, first off, we have two different ways we can analyze things in set theory. Uh, basically, set theory is a way that we can analyze music in an atonal aspect uh, using intervals or what we call pitch classes. Now, pitch class, uh, which is this integer notation, uh, it's a way of assigning a pitch class to each note. So C is zero, C sharp is one, D is two, D sharp is three, and so on. So each semitone has a pitch class. This is a way of identifying pitches in an alternate way, and it helps in composition because by assigning numbers to a uh, pitch, now we can use mathematical formulas or even a random number generator to help us create our tone rows. Now, in the uh, interval notation, basically what it does is it counts the distance between different parts to see the distance, but using the interval as a number. So what this can do is this can give us a quick way of seeing what kind of intervals are in it. And just by looking at it, here I have the example from page one, and then the two, the first two from page two, you can see really the interval is what we need to be focusing on. And the interval class, it's eight, 10, six, seven, two, four. So long story short, it's never the same. So we see this almost somewhat random instance of this, at least to the point where they're not reoccurring. 
However, uh, despite the numerous reiterations, we never see it in retrograde. Retrograde would be running it backwards. So in this case, it would mean starting by going up and then ending with the two repeated notes. Contrary to this, this is inversion. So this is just instead of going down, it's going up. So basically the direction is reversed, but the actual intervals would stay the same if you were to invert this. But retrograde would mean flipping it around, which would mean starting with this, then this, and then these two notes. And because we never see this in retrograde, we see that he clearly wants the harmonic arc that this makes to be very profound. This downward sweep, especially with these two repeating notes, is very important and it serves almost as a checkpoint for the listener to help them understand what's going on. And it can be hard to listen to this piece sometimes, but especially if you do some analysis, you'll see lots of themes like this run up. Uh, I haven't had this score for very long, but I've already found several themes. And one of the ways that he creates themes is through textures. Uh, you can see right here, I've actually notated a little bit on this, but we have this big rising section with really wide intervals uh, leading to a triplet section that goes in the opposite direction. So in this case, this is two eight tone rows going up to this moment of very complex harmony. And in, in the case of the beginning, it ends with this really low octava basso part. Uh, I'll play just this little section for you now, just to see what it sounds like. And you can see it's quite intense, but uh, the actual feeling of this is very distinct. And we actually see this a lot later on page 13. We see a similar thing where we've got all this uh, tension slowly building up. You see, I'll play this example starting from right here at the encore plus vif. Uh, and it's starting very piano and slowly getting more intense into these triplets. And then we have this big moment where again, we have two eight tone rows. We have this section and then we have this section and then we have the triplets going in the opposite direction. See, I'll play it for you now so you can get a sense of what it sounds like. As you can maybe hear, this has a very similar feeling to the example on page one, except everything is inverted. So instead of the 16th going up and the triplets going down, it's the reverse effect. So again, we see Boulez recycling these themes and using them again in a very clever way where the theme is almost, you know, the harmony is not going to be exactly the same. and. <laughs> The pitch classes haven't been exactly recycled, but we see the same underlying form of two eight tone rows followed by a triplet section of very harsh harmony. Now, one area where I feel that Boulez's writing really shines is particularly in the second movement of this piece. Uh, it's lent with eighth note equaling 60 BPM, which is very slow. And this amounts to a very airy, uh, almost space-like to me. It's very interesting to see the way that the writing often looks a bit similar on the page, although it's more spread out. But at the same time, uh, it has a very different quality. And I think the 12 tone technique really shines in slower uh, instances because you get to relish the quality of each of those notes especially uh, in the start of this movement too, which I'll play for you in a sec. Uh, it starts very open-ended and uh, very wide range that's covered. And in the first three measures, all of the notes constitute a full 12 tone row. And you see this trend throughout and just the way that it's written is very, 
very interesting and very useful. So I hope that what I've shown you has demystified at least a little bit of his compositional process in showing the way that he uses themes uh, in a less traditional sense. You know, if, if you think about like the sword light motif from Wagner's Ring Cycle. It is a very, very iconic little uh, light motif that's used over and over at least 50 times throughout the opera cycle, maybe more. And in this way, he's using his own sense of light motifs, but in a different way. And while we can't see into his head, we can start to get an idea for how he was thinking and how he uses this 12 tone technique uh, at a very, very strong level. So anyways, that's about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in another.